Learning Ally is a proud sponsor of the Empowered Dyslexia podcast. Learning Ally, a nonprofit education organization, helps to transform the lives of struggling learners by delivering proven solutions that help students reach their potential. We have a heritage of supporting students with a reading deficit like dyslexia. Our award winning Human Red audiobook solution helps students in grades 3 through 12 access books they want and need to read to help them succeed. Visit www.learningally.org for more information. The following content is not intended as a substitute for professional legal advice, medical advice, diagnosis or treatment. Always seek the advice of your attorney, advocate, physician or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding any medical or educational concerns. Hello and welcome to Empower Dyslexia. I'm Steven, you're out. I'm Asha, you're out. And we're here to help you um, be a better informed partner in education. Uh, on this show, we're gonna discuss um, dyslexia uh, and other related disorders. We discuss uh, research intervention. We also um, interview experts in their field. We talk about special education policy at the state, federal, and uh, local level. And the, the part that I like the most is we talk to uh, those of you who have personal stories about um, dealing with uh, struggling learning disabilities, however you wanna look at it. Um, and I mean, that's, that's what we're here for. Please be sure to like us on uh, Facebook and YouTube. Subscribe to us, leave us a comment. We love to know um, how we're doing and that the information that we're providing is um, what you need. And I've got my Empower Dyslexia shirt on today to uh, start off the um, Dyslexia Awareness Month. So it's looking pretty good there. And uh, Big announcement, we're gonna give away a shirt every day in October. All you need to do is like, follow, share, comment on your favorite show, share your favorite show, comment on it, tag Empower Dyslexia so we know that you've done it, and we'll put your name in the hat for a free t-shirt. What do you think about that? Pretty awesome. Pretty awesome, huh? Um, and as, as always, if uh, you like to watch the show, you know, it's either Facebook Live or YouTube Live, and then you can download the audio version of this uh, show on any of the your favorite apps um, that you get your podcasts on. If you have it, we're there. So make sure that you, uh, you download it and uh, leave us a review. So uh, Asher is joining me today because he's got some uh, exciting news. Yes. So what, what, <laughs> what do you want to tell people, Asher? Um, we've kind of been talking and I kind of came up with the idea that I think it would be a good idea to start a Empower Dyslexia like kid edition, student edition for kids that are going through school and that don't know really I guess how it they feel like an outsider looking in I guess you could say um, and that it's okay for them to have dyslexia or any type of learning disability and that um, how to like self-advocate for themselves and and or um, you know tell their teachers you know this is what this is what has to be done, and yeah, you know, there's nothing. You know, you can't not do this for me, right? So, 
we have a, uh, a quick video that we put together. Let's check it out. I love that a show for us by us because a lot of times you know our kid the kids are, are left out of the conversation they are um, they don't understand what's going on their, their fates already decided for them by their parents or, or whoever teachers or whoever's at least they think they think it is right yeah so uh, I'm really excited to see uh, what you do with it. I mean, you've come a long way uh, since you were first identified and even your your own self-advocacy and, you know, standing up for getting what you are afforded when it comes to school. So I'm, I am so proud of you um, for taking this, this next step. So your shows will be broadcast on Tuesdays. Wow the regular Empower Dyslexia is going to be broadcast on Thursday. So I'm excited. I can't wait. Um, so this morning, today's topic is about low literacy rates, poor instruction uh, around dyslexia, and social ills, 101 for advocates. I mean, this is, this is a, a very deep conversation. I mean, th this is a, we're going to unpack a lot of information here. Um, our guest is a, my good friend, Debbie Meyer. Uh, she is um, the Decoding Dyslexia New York City chapter, a founding member of Dyslexia Plus and Public Schools Task Force, and she is an amazing, amazing advocate, uh, constantly out there uh, fighting for my kids and yours. So I would like uh, your help in, in welcoming Debbie to the show. Good morning, Debbie. Hey, good morning, Steve. How are you? Doing wonderful. Man, it's been a long time coming. I, I can't believe I got you on the show finally. Yeah, um, but I hope I've sent you other good people like Hildebrand. Oh, I yeah. I was so excited that he was on your show. It was awesome. Hildebrand is amazing. Yeah. So, so. let's uh, let's dive into this. Um, I'm excited right. to, to hear your presentation on on um, you know the low literacy rates, uh, poor instruction, and really how this drives, I mean, this goes right into uh, what we've been talking about over the last few months. This drives right into the pipeline to prison. You know, we talk about uh, low literacy rates. It, it puts you on the road to poverty, the jailhouse, and a lot of times the cemetery. And we wanna make sure that we exactly. stop that. All right, well, I will get ready and share my screen. Um, I know this is going to be audio version also, so please pipe in if something is on the screen, but I haven't said it out loud and you think it really needs to be said out loud. Awesome. All right, do you see a, a picture of a couple guys? There you go. All right, I'm gonna move my picture of myself out of the way. So. I'm really excited to be here and share what I've been learning with my Bundles Community Scholarship at Columbia University and as the parent of a dyslexic kid here in New York City. Those are kind of my two things that really qualify me to be here. Um, uh, at Columbia, I get to um, audit classes, I get to meet with professors, and I get to use the library and get past all those paywalls to get research. So it's kind of a really amazing opportunity. But I would like all your listeners to go and grab a pen and paper because we're going to do some exercises together in a few minutes to help people understand dyslexia. Awesome. In the meantime, I'm going to start with some questions. Um, do you know anyone that doesn't go to a library or a bookstore to get a book? Someone uh, that only looks at headlines in a newspaper or flips through magazine looking at pictures? Maybe you've met someone that's really nervous to read aloud at Passover Seder. 
You know anyone that seems to read okay to get by but can't spell? You get an email or a text from somebody and just wonder about all the misspellings? You know, most stuff is written at what's considered eighth grade reading level, but nationally, 66% of eighth graders don't read at eighth grade reading level. There's a disconnect there. Um, our school chancellor um, said last year that literacy is a social justice issue and should lead the equity agenda. And I couldn't agree more. I'm also going to argue that poor instruction is a public health crisis. Recently, um, Nadine Gab of Harvard said in a slideshow that literacy is a widely recognized predictor of health outcomes, connecting with academic, social, career access, and economic success measures. And this was clear during COVID-19 spring. So these are just some of the social ills that underliterate -liter people face. So here's the agenda for today. I'm not gonna be offering a lot of the signs and symptoms of dyslexia. This is not a review of all the scripted literacy programs or specific resources, but I'm gonna highlight the hallmarks of an evidence-based literacy program. And at the end, you'll get my contact information. So this um, presentation isn't for um, learning how to teach a dyslexic kid. It's in, aimed at creating advocates for better literacy instruction. So to start, we're gonna look at literacy um, instructions history. Um, it's coming waves and it's kind of like whether the earth is round or flat, whether climate change is real, vaccines, and now whether masks contribute to public health. Um, all these are arguments about people that believe in science, data, and evidence, or don't. But with the science of reading, it's even more tricky because we have people that believe in teaching science, but aren't invested in the science of reading. So at the beginning of the last century, we began to understand how important synthetic phonics was. The blueback spellers and the guffy readers were part of this. But then some psycholinguists, a really elite group led by Arthur Gates from Columbia's Teacher College, thought this was drill and kill. Some of you might remember Dick and Jane. It was memorization of repeated words. They thought semantics was enough. Repetition and predictability of whole words would build a bank of words a student could rely on. But the phonics advocates rebelled and more scientific research began. Um, Dr. Samuel Orton and Anna, Anna Gillingham at Teachers College provided much of this research and they created rules for the synthetic codes to teach kids how to read and they made it pretty easy for teachers. Um, they understood that semantics was important and language work was important but these codes were really important. Diana King implemented this at Sidbury Friends in Washington, D.C. with all the struggling readers. And in short time, these kids were reading and writing better than their friends who were being taught with whole word. Clearly, we need phonics and semantics, word work and sentence works. But later, the psycholinguists came back, they adjusted, and they gave us whole language. That was predictable books, leveled readers, and no phonics just memorization of words using cues from pictures and other words to build a bank of words in your brain. Uh, but then in the 1990s, when California um, had their really big decline in reading proficiency, Congress called for a national reading panel of experts to look at the best practices in reading instruction. They looked at 100,000 studies and published this comprehensive report. Again, scientists recommended phonics and semantics but they weren't really clear and it wasn't implemented well. In response to the panel's recommendations, we got not very balanced literacy that is considered to be um, by many to be um, whole language in sheep's clothing. And we got a lot of independent phonics programs that don't work well in isolation. Still, people that can afford tutoring or specialized schools can benefit from the science of reading based on Orton and Gillingham's work. That work's been proven several times over with functional MRIs that highlight neurobiology and neurodiversity in acquiring reading skills. Currently though, our instruction does not align with our service-based economy, which requires reading to be successful. And that's what I'm gonna talk about. So neurodiversity, there's a lot of neurodiversity in how we learn to read. 
And how do we know this? We know it from functional MRI brain scans. And we have reading scores that match these. I'm not showing you these uh, brain scans because they're really difficult for lay people to really decode. Rather, I'm gonna explain neurodiversity. You've probably met people that picked up chess or checkers very easily and can see three or four or more moves ahead. Other people have trouble memorizing the patterns each piece moves and, or make one move at a time before considering the next. And Rubik's cubes. You've probably seen people that twist so quickly you can't track what they are doing. Others memorize patterns some never get it. If I had the functional MRI brain scans taken when these people were engaged in such activities, you'd see different parts of their brain active depending on whether they were naturally talented at these or not. With music, we have the same thing. Some people have natural talent, some people learn it, and some people are incredibly tone deaf. Rhythm has similar things. So my aunt tells me that as a young child, she took piano lessons for years and never got very good. And she'd be incredibly frustrated when my father sat down next to her and played by ear beautifully. My father could play any instrument by ear, it seems. My mother, she had very little musical talent. My sister got all that musical talent from my father. I did not. So all of this is to explain that people's brains have different strengths. Much of this is neurobiological and much is hereditary. There's neurodiversity in reading as well. Like the other examples, it's on this continuum. And the studies show that your predisposition for literacy acquisition is about 50% hereditary. You know, reading and spelling are no more natural than solving a Rubik's cube. And it hasn't been a law around, in the scope of things, much longer really than the printing press. Gutenberg's printing press came around 1440, which is pretty recent in human history. So on this chart, you'll see about 5% of people learn to read really effortlessly. Others learn pretty easily. This is who our instruction, our broad instruction is driven at. Um, what's broad instruction? It can be anything that is watered down, invented by teachers with help from Pinterest or Teachers Pay Teachers. Um, it can be good programs delivered poorly for, or programs that are um, antithetical to learn, reading instruction like Fontes and Pinnell and historically the Teachers College Reading and Writing Program. It can even be poorly conceived or poorly delivered remediation programs. Those people here in the dark area need really good instruction. And our literacy scores are evidence that our kids are not getting really good instruction. We'll talk about what really good instruction is recent, um, shortly. And these are the dyslexic students. You will hear different prevalent statistics about dyslexia that say it's five to 12% of the population. Others say 10 to 15% and still others say 20%. We usually hear that it makes up 80% of all learning disabilities. If one parent is dyslexic, there's a 50% chance that a child will be as well. But because of generations of poor instruction, learning to read then um, is, will be considered hereditary, social, and educational. This um, everyone's probably seen before. It's a pretty important infographic and it's known as Scarborough's Reading Rope. It explains how we learn to read well. I'll be referring to some of these concepts later on. Science tells us that you need word recognition, which begins with phonemes and syllables to build phonological awareness. Phonological awareness, decoding and sight recognition or connecting the sounds to the symbols are what make up word recognition. And when woven together with language comprehension, a student can learn to read. This is the simple view of reading. Reading is the product of both. If one is zero, then the reading is zero because you need both. Most teachers understand the top part of this rope. Those um, are really good strategies when you are reading to learn, which for most kids should be third or fourth grade. Very few early education teachers understand the bottom part of this and are prepared to implement the good instruction this requires so students can learn to read. This presentation is gonna discuss 
um, the bottom part of this rope much more because that's what most teachers are not prepared to address. And it's where most students need extra instruction, not less. So what is dyslexia? The IDA defines dyslexia as a specific learning disability that is neurobiological in origin, is characterized by difficulties with accurate or fluent word recognition and by poor spelling and decoding abilities. These difficulties typically result from a deficit in the phonological component of language from the reading rope we just saw that is often unexpected in relation to other cognitive abilities and the provision of effective classroom instruction. However, without effective classroom instruction, kids with dyslexia and low IQ struggle with phonological issues just like mid-range and high IQ kids. The amount of effective classroom instruction needed and the amount of repetition may vary. We'll talk about effective classroom instruction next, but first I have some work for you to do. So please get your pen and paper ready. Most dyslexia presentations use a complicated sim simulation with nonsense words. Today, I'm gonna use some examples from just plain regular English. So please write down these words in a list. Cough, like a cold, rough, like sandpaper, through, like you go through a tunnel, though, like however or nevertheless, and plow, like you plow snow or you plow a field. And yes, there's two ways to spell that just to make it more complicated. Go ahead and say them out loud a few times. Cough, rough, through, though, and plow. Do they rhyme? Do they look like they should rhyme? All right, now switch your pen to your non-dominant hand and write the word baloney, like the sandwich meat. All right, now next write the word pony, like a small horse. Do they look like they should rhyme? All right, continuing with your non-dominant hand, I have two harder words for you to write. Consequences and paradoxes. So what was different about your unnatural hand? Did you think about each letter and how to form it? Okay, put your pen back in your strong hand, your dominant hand. We're gonna do another list. The first word is aid, like help or band-aid. The next is tray, like something you would carry things on. Next is table, where you might set the tray down. Sunday, uh, something that you make with ice cream and you might be carrying on the tray. Cake, that also might be on the tray. Prey, what an eagle hunts or a coyote hunts. Break, what happens if you drop that tray? and eight, the number after seven and before nine. Do you know what all these words have in common? All right, tell you in a minute if you haven't figured it out. I'm gonna have you write five more words. Lemonade. Sunday, like the day of the week where people go to church. Pray, what some people do at church on Sunday. Break, what a car or a bike needs to stop. And eight, like what we did to the cake or the sundae. Did you know how many ways we have to spell the long A sound? What about how many homophones we have? Okay, one more exercise, just this last one. 
Please write these lowercase letters in a list. B, D, P, and Q. Are they the same symbol flipped around and upside down? These exercises we just did demonstrate that sometimes our language symbols are one, two, three, or four or more letters long. And the same symbol can have many sounds. Different symbols can have the same sound. And some symbols look a lot alike. This is a lot for pre-K, K, first and second grade. After all, what happens if you flip a chair around or upside down? It's still a chair. When a young child is beginning to recognize letters and their sounds, they might remember that a letter is a ball and stick character. They might not remember which one. Kids need to learn this in a systematic way. Mastery is, a, is essential. For example, we should not expect kids to learn all the ways to make the long A sound right away. That would clearly be overwhelming. S students should learn the common ways, such as vowel constant E, like the word cake, or a car break, or lemonade. They will learn vowel team AI comes at the beginning or middle of a word, like aid or sale. And they might learn that AY says long A at the end of the word, like tray or pray, like people do at a house of worship. Other more difficult spellings of long A are introduced and supported as they come up in reading, but not explicitly taught early on. An example would be, the number eight. So more about dyslexia. It can be even more complicated. Double deficit dyslexia, like poor verbal short-term memory, uh, poor rapid or automatic um, naming or articulation speed, um, make it harder for such kids to learn to read. But with intense instruction, they can. Often mnemonic devices help. With good instruction and accommodations, double deficit dyslexic kids can become active citizens. Dyslexia can be comorbid with other conditions. Dysgraphia, trouble with writing and organizing thoughts on paper is addressed with dyslexia. Dyscalculia is addressed with direct instruction and multisensory practice in math. Executive function issues can often be helped with good planning and organizational systems taught with direct instruction. These other conditions, ADD, ADHD, autism, or ASD, vision or auditory issues and other health issues can often be accommodated in schools and with doctor's help. But we have a Matthew effect. The rich get richer and the poor get poorer. If you aren't taught to read, you don't like to read and you learn less. So we have these people, I'm sorry, called social deficit dyslexic kids. Um, there's a lack of language at home, lack of language in daycare and preschool, a lack of parent advocates, poor instruction at school, and lack of background knowledge. Okay. And it can just I, makes it harder to read. Can I ask a question real quick um, sure. on this? So <clears throat> where where is the term social deficit uh, dyslexia coming from? I made it up as I started learning more things because okay. it may or may not be neurobiological dyslexia, but the kids need the same thing. Right. They need the same kind of help. Absolutely. I mean, so I just wanted to to, to um, ask that question. So sorry, go ahead. Sure. Yeah, it's not an official term, but maybe it'll become one. So a lot of people have asked me if I think our poor literacy instruction is part of the new Jim Crow. And I'm still not sure if it is that nefarious, but a lot of people think so and it clearly has the same results. Um, the Annie E. Casey 2020 Kids Count Report was recently released. Um, you see, we're just not teaching kids to read. Um, but these kids from moderate and high income families, they often get more help. And so they're starting to learn to read by fourth grade. And if they get more help, they get tutors, they get into specialized schools. A lot of them get to college. Um, However, so, how, how, so, so let me let me jump in there. However, though, <clears throat> we also know that there are a lot of even wealthy people that 
uh, our, our families that if not given the right instruction, if not given the right remediation, um, you know, they still struggle and will struggle Absolutely. with dyslexia. Absolutely. So, you know, I, I, I tend to push back a little bit when we, when we try to um, um, segregate out, you know, the reading issue is, you know, dyslexia, from, from my perspective at least, dyslexia does not discriminate. Um, it, it really loves us all. Uh, rich, poor, black, white, brown, it doesn't matter. Uh, we need to make sure that we're providing that uh, appropriate, scientifically proven remediation uh, for reading instruction. Yeah. So my son went to a specialized school for dyslexia. Most of the kids in there came from the incredibly costly independent schools in New York. These were not uh, moderate income kids that he went to school with. Um, so if people that didn't read didn't also have the bet, the people that can read didn't also have the best access to college and careers, would their communities be filled with people that read more easily with less instruction or with tutors or specialized school? You know, this Matthew effect goes both ways. So I promise to share the hallmarks of good literacy instruction. And next I'll compare it to what's going on in school. Um, and I'll explain all these things a little in a little bit in more detail on the next slide. But um, basically, I wanted to say that remediation cannot be shortchanged if a student is far behind and especially is getting contrary instruction. Um, you just can't do it once or twice a week. It has to be every day. Um, you'll see how all this kind of echoes the reading rope. We look at five pillars of reading and other support. No, one's call, no one calls himself a phonics advocate. Phonics are necessary, but they're not sufficient. And I can't emphasize enough how important background knowledge is and why remediation shouldn't be timed during social studies, science, art, or phys ed. And we, and we see that a lot. We see the, you know, especially in the um, elementary schools, we see that the, the children have the pullouts and, exactly. and you know they're they're missing that piece of um, right. Of class. So they're not getting background knowledge when they're pulled out of things to give them background knowledge. It wants, Even phys ed gives background knowledge. Yeah, it and teaches you things. Once they get into high school, uh, middle school and high school, especially here in Texas, they um, actually take away one of your electives, and that becomes your dyslexia remediation class. So you're right. you're not able to participate in any of the other. Or, or, or at least one less elective or something that you really be right. interested in. Yeah, it should really only happen during ELA class or before school. It shouldn't even happen after school because most kids are way too tired then. So, you know, background knowledge, it's gonna help you with vocabulary and comprehension. There's no question about it. And you can get it from read alouds, audiobooks, rich discussions, podcasts, all sorts of things will give you background knowledge before you learn to read. Um, if you're taught the sounds before the letter names, your phonemic awareness and phonological awareness will develop faster. But almost everyone is taught the alphabet before the sounds. Decodable texts will help with your synthetic phonics and learning, all, learning this more. It reinforces it, and I'll talk about that a little bit more later. And the multi-sensory practice and cursive help develop mastery for kids and keywords and symbols. They can help younger kids by helping them remember like an apple and the short A sound. Keywords and symbols of other kinds help older kids learn how to take notes without transcribing a lecture or copying uh, things out of books. So um, learning to read and reading to learn are two different processes. Balanced literacy and structured literacy um, are two different ways of teaching. And we're gonna talk about both of those next. But I wanna ask if any of you um, uh, viewers have seen these posters or something like this in schools. These are what are failing to teach kids to read. And I'll explain why next. So 
Balanced literacy expects you arrive at school with your uh, phonological awareness and phonemic awareness. Structured literacy teaches it. So, so real quick on that piece, I mean, even in our our um, Texas Teaks, the um, Texas Central Knowledge, it's it's written into that that when you come into preschool or pre K, K, you're supposed to have already known your letters, your sounds, how to write your name. I mean, so it's already written into the curriculum on most, I would, I would argue that it's probably most states, but I, I know for a fact here in Texas it is. Yeah, no, it's great. If, you're, if you come from a house where you're not exposed to a whole lot of language, you just won't arrive at kindergarten knowing these things. Well, the other piece of that, uh, Debbie, is one of the sayings I, I like to say all the time is if you're speaking to a, uh, a parent of a dyslexic, the chances are of you speaking to a dyslexic are pretty high. So if that parent doesn't have or has dyslexia, the chances of them not reading, them not having that, um, that higher level of education is pretty high. So, exactly. I mean, that's, that's part of, you know, showing up to school without those um, skills. However, I want to make sure that we, we say we're not, uh, this is not a blame to parents that, hey, you didn't read enough to your kid or yeah. you, you didn't work with your kid enough in the early ages because, as we know, you know, the majority of us do. And it's and a lot of times it's it still doesn't matter. Exactly. Um, my kid, what had a comprehension in kindergarten of some ridiculous level. He had read he had been read so many books, but he didn't have his phonemic awareness. He wasn't ready to learn to read. Balanced literacy uses phonics light. Um, or. Um, and structured literacy uses synthetic phonics and they teach them systematically. Um, if you, you have to scaffold these things. You have to teach addition before multiplication. You teach phonics um, scaffolded, building on things that they already have so you can take the next one. You'll take kids on a bunny hill and not directly to the top of a black diamond mountain. Stretchy snake, Flippy Dolphin, Lips the Fish, Chunky Monkey are all incidental phonics. They're not built on any systems. Guessing takes your concentration off a word to decode so it doesn't have a chance to make it into your memory bank. The codes don't make it to your memory bank either. Often kids guess synonyms. They make sense in the story, but they have nothing to do with the printed words. Um, eagle Eye. Um, you know, try and lion, Skippy the frog, all these things, um, kids will be guessing, you know, is that a house or a cottage, a village or a town? Um, it may not make much difference to the story, but it'll make a difference in how a kid learns how to read. And I would, I would argue that, um, the guessing and the cueing, um, is more, uh, especially in the, in the younger age, well, even in the older age, it's a, not a guessing and a cueing, it's a skipping. Yes, but, um, you know, I mean, if people look at the, we were... at the picture and they see a picture of a place where you might live, they might guess cottage or house, mm -hmm. you know, and when you're looking at those pictures. So, um, so leveled readers and predictable readers um, don't have enough <clears throat> structure to them. And so teachers will count the errors, but they won't know what to address. If you categorize the errors, so you can um, prescribe what's missing, you'll lear learn a lot more about how to teach reading. Um, also, if um, an instructional leader is looking at what most of the kids aren't getting in their decodable readers, um, what skills they don't have, they can help the teacher teach them better. So categorizing the errors is much more important, and you can do that with decodable books. Mini lessons, um, a hallmark of a lot of programs, are not bad in themselves. In fact, they can reinforce something you've already learned. 
but they don't replace explicit instruction based on fidelity or mastery. Now, explicit instruction is I do, you, we do, you do. Or for a dyslexic kid, it might be I do, I do, you do, or we do, we do, we do, you do, you do, practice, 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 practice. Um, think about how um, fidelity and mastery are used with music or sports. You don't skip ahead until you master the skills you need. If you don't know a chord, you can't play the song that requires that chord. You don't throw small, fast balls at a kid in early phys ed. You start with something like throwing scarves or foam and then rolling big balls, medium softer balls, and eventually tennis balls and baseballs. You scaffold instruction and you work on mastery or else somebody gets frustrated or hurt. Sight words, they even have different definitions. Sight words, are they common words that you have to memorize just because they're common, or are they words that follow no code and you have no choice but to memorize them? So this system on the left is fine when you are reading to learn and you have a big memory bank. Um, it is antithetical to learning how to read. So earlier, I had you spell paradoxes and consequences so they'd be on your mind. Your brain is most plastic in the early years. And you hear this a lot about foreign languages. Little kids can learn foreign languages early. But you can learn English, your, your home language, just as early. And it takes twice as long to remediate a fourth grader as it does to teach a first grader. Schools use efforts like response to intervention or multi-tiered system of supports, and it takes years to find the dyslexic students and help them. Parents are sometimes told that some students just take longer to learn to read, and they don't, and parents never question the instruction. Some even hear boys take longer to learn to read, or kids are told that they are lazy or not trying. Kids get lay labeled with behavioral issues um, because teachers don't understand the source of frustration when students can't keep up with their peers. Worse, this, frust this frustration gets criminalized and penalized in many schools. There's all sorts of implications, social, emotional, academic, economic. But so many screeners um, exist. Um, even um, those for preschool teachers or doctor's offices could use to determine risk for dyslexia and hopefully drive better instruction. And as we understand the neurobiological and genetic underpinnings of dyslexia and learning to read, these screeners are going to get better and better. Still, we have to fight for the kids that are simply getting poor instruction, whether or not they are neurobiologically dyslexic. You know, kids get left back in the kindergarten. They're taught the same thing again and again, as if it's going to work the second time around. Or they're spent, sent to special ed with the same curriculum slowed down. That doesn't work. Or with kids with completely different issues. Sometimes they're not really caught until they have to read to learn in third or fourth grade, and they really begin to fail. So I'm going to talk about the disconnect that creates such havoc for struggling leaders and their families. Universities have, leave teachers, doctors, and social workers unprepared to help struggling leaders and their families to find pathways to achievement in school and life. Research in the last 20 years, as I mentioned, on fMRIs and neurobiological studies has codified how literacy instruction is hereditary, social, and educational. The information on this and best practices for reading instruction remains in the domains of neuroscience and psychology and is seldom the focus of teacher preparation programs, medical schools, or schools of social work. Thus, the IDEA, the Individuals for Education, education with Disabilities Education Act, and the RTI or MTSS systems fail struggling leaders and dyslexic kids. The private and nonprofit sector has created an incredibly confusing dyslexia industrial complex. Optimally, what I think should happen is all K-3 teachers should know how to teach reading. Uh, right now, their licenses do not um, test whether they can teach reading or not. All special ed teachers should understand dyslexia and how to teach reading. Pediatricians should know how to assess for it. You know they ask a lot about Tay-Sachs syndrome and sickle cell, and you have to have two parents with both of those genes to get it. With dyslexia, you only need one parent to have a, to be possible to get it. So pediatricians should know how to help. 
all school psychologists should understand this. Um, only some do now. Social workers that work with kids should understand this because um, you know they're going into families often that struggle reading and they should be able to identify this and actually break the chain. And you know, I'm okay with some neuroscientists um, understanding it, not, you know, there's other specialties you should have. Um, and more social science researchers should understand this and really help us um, figure out how we're going to change this system. So what are the results? This is why I'm here. I think this is why Steve is here. You know, again, I asked you to write the word consequences because not only is it a four syllable complicated word, but I wanted you to have consequences on your mind. Steve, do you wanna read through these? Yeah, I mean, this is this is something we talk about all the time. You know, 50% of the, uh, the, the original study was done in Texas and it's 50% of the, the inmate population in Texas, uh, it's actually over 50% have uh, dyslexia or has been screened and known to have dyslexia. The other statistic that's that's there that uh, we don't talk about a lot of times is the 80% or actually 80 plus percent of the Texas prisoners are functioning illiterate. So it, it really ties that uh, education uh, to or lack of education, lack of literacy to the pipeline to prison. 40% you know, of the homeless people out there, you know, they have the same issues are going on, dyslexia, uh, functioning illiterate. Um, the, the NAEP scores that just came out in 2019 that shows that fourth, eighth, and 12th graders that, you know, it was, you have 66, I, I believe the, what I was reading, 64% uh, don't read on grade level, which is at a 27th percent uh, percentage. Yeah. And if you can't read, if you can't even make it to grade level, we are doing something terribly, terribly wrong. Exactly. And you know, some people say it's the test, but if you're reading at second or third grade level um, in eighth grade, that's not the test. Yeah. I mean, we, we, we over test these kids um, mm -hmm. with everything that you could put Asher, my son just goes, uh-huh. Uh, I mean, we have uh, CBAs, we have map testing, we have uh, here in Texas, we have star test. And like then we this have week, this week alone. It, was, it started last week. We had to take a pretest for the test, and the pretest was like sixty questions, and the main test was like thirteen. Like I don't understand. It uh, should it's, be. It's, it's just it's, it's on and on. In these these kids, you know, they get burned out on it. When, you know, are we are we really doing uh, all of this testing to create better tests, or are we? The other piece of it that I don't understand, and I, I can't get a really uh, a clear answer, for, nobody can really tell me, is what are we doing with all this data, all this testing data that's out there? What are we doing it, it with it? It clearly is not driving instruction. It, it absolutely it is not driving any type of change in instruction. Somebody somewhere is using yeah. it, but it's not being used <sighs> in the education system. I can tell yeah. you that. It's we not might, driving... It's not driving instruction, it's not driving teacher preparation, and it's not driving teacher licensing. Absolutely, and it, it needs to change. Um, the, the, this was a, a, a figure that I've been looking for, and I'm glad that, that you have this on here. I, I wanted to know, what does it look like? What is the actual cost when we do not teach our students to read? You know, if we take that student and remove, our, even when we're looking at how much it costs to deal with that student due to truancy, due to behavior problems, uh, on through, you know, adulthood, and whether they end up in prison or uh, poverty or whatever it is, what is the loss to the tax base and the, um, the opportunity to get out there and be part of the workforce. I mean, that, that $2 trillion, 2.2 trillion, that is uh, unbelievable. And yeah, why? Yeah. And why? Yeah. Because we, we put it, 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 we have to lay it squarely at the feet of the education system. 
So yeah. we need the education system to step up and, and make a decision um, to do what your charter is, is to educate all kids, no matter what their ability is or disability. Because you talk about disconnect from school, when you can't read and you can't participate, there's a huge disconnect. Why would you even wanna be there? There's no reason you're taking up space. And absolutely it ends up causing mental health issues. The fact that you, and I, I try to get people to understand that, you know, when we used to hear that you couldn't be um, tested for dyslexia until your third grade, you've already, if that child enters school at kindergarten, you've already caused four years of anxiety, depression, mental health issues that you're going to have to go back and try to help, which they, that, that piece of it, especially here in Texas, because 504, dyslexia is under 504, we don't even look at the mental aspect of this. We don't. So, you know, earlier I said that I was going to argue about this being a public health crisis. And we saw this during COVID-19 New York City spring. You know, data showed that COVID affected black and brown communities more. But as they dug into the data, they saw it wasn't just comor comorbid conditions. It was education and career options that affected our black and brown communities. It's exposing them to the highly contagious um, coronavirus. If you weren't taught to read well, what options do you have? Are you not earning enough to support a nuclear family independently and instead living with multiple generations? Are you working at a frontline job in a grocery store or a low paying job in a city hospital? You know, it wasn't really a comorbid conditions out front. It was that the, all these people that didn't have this great education had the worst jobs. Um, and then people that can't read are really disenfranchised. Um, in New York State, our ballot initiatives are not only complicated and written at 15th grade level, if you get help to understand them before you go to the voting booth, you will find ballot initiative two directly under ballot initiative one. And you'll find ballot initiative three to the right of one, more like Chinese, Japanese, or Korean. It, it, so, def it definitely is set up um, in a way to confuse you. You vote yes, it's really for no. And, you know, yeah. we, we know that there is such a huge population of our, our, um, of our population that can't properly read. Um, so we are, we're running up on, um, on our time here uh, with Debbie. Uh, but okay. real quick, I want to I want to touch on you know your last slide here, um, because yes, this is a um, this is a human health crisis. Um, I say that this to me this is the largest civil rights issue of my lifetime, and I would almost argue of anybody's lifetime, because when you can't read. Just like Frederick Douglass said, once you, be, once you can read, you'll never be a slave again. You'll never be locked down. So, you know, I challenge each of our teachers and our administrators that are listening to this, what can you do? What can you personally do to make sure that every child in your school system uh, is given the appropriate scientifically based, proven remediation, and it works for all kids. That's what I don't understand. If you teach all, right, I'm gonna all take you kids one up. that way. I'm asking for initial instruction. Yes. I'm asking university leaders in their um, pre-service um, education programs to prepare um, not just their teachers, but their social workers and doctors and the lawmakers to make real licensing changes. Absolutely. So, so I'll just go through this last slide and then we'll, um, you know, any other questions. So the kid on the right um, or on the left is my son. Um, we thought we won the lottery when he got into this public progressive school and he learned incredible content, but skills were a byproduct. 
He was still reading at first or second grade level when we pulled him out to go to the Winwood School at fifth grade. At Winward, he learned a lot of skills. He learned how to read, but he was so far behind. Content was a byproduct. But now he's at Bard High School Early College, and it's one of the screen schools in New York City. On the right is our friend Amir Baraka. He never learned to read in school, couldn't do homework. He dropped out of high school. In prison, he learned he was dyslexic, and after he was finally released, he learned how to read. So they're both now advocates. So this is my call to action. Find your local um, or state decoding dyslexia or um, International Dyslexia Association branch and find out what the laws and policies are in your state. Organize an even more local presentation at your school or district. I'm happy to continue to do this virtually for people. And I thank you very much. I'm gonna give you my contact information. Um, and these are all great videos to watch and learn a little bit more about dyslexia. Absolutely. Thank you so much for coming on. Uh, great presentation. We had a lot Thank of you. we had a lot of uh, really good response. Um, you know, we'll we'll have Debbie back on, and you know, we're, as we're working through this, um, killing the pipeline to prison. Uh, I want to make sure that you know we we say again. Please like us on Facebook, on YouTube, uh, leave us a review. Uh, it really helps us to, to um, gear and to derive this show. As always, we like to recommend, if you think that your child is having uh, or struggling in school and there's a possibility that your child may have a learning disability, please don't wait. Please, uh, the, the process is and should be fairly simple to request testing from your, from your school district. We have um, template letters on our website www.empowerdyslexia.info and download it, put your information in it, turn it into your school counselor. This starts the timeline to get your child tested. Um, again, thank you so much uh, for allowing me to do this show every week. It's such an honor. And also I wanna rem remind everybody October is Dyslexia Awareness Month. Make sure that you're saying uh, dyslexia and talking about dyslexia and reading disabilities to any and everybody that you speak to. Um, we, are, we are here to help try to save lives. And that is li literally and figuratively. So thank you again. Um, until next time, here's a word from our sponsors. Learning Ally is a proud sponsor of the Empowered Dyslexia podcast. At Learning Ally, we are always looking for new ways to engage readers struggling with a reading deficit like dyslexia and help them work to their potential. Visit www.learningally.org to learn about the Learning Ally audiobook solution, including which of your students are eligible for access. If you live in Texas, we have great news. The Texas Education Agency provides access to the Learning Ally audiobook solution for all K-12 public and charter school students with reading deficits. Get started today by visiting www.learningally.org/texas.